Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. So last time we were talking about, we had just done completing the square a couple times. So let's do that uh, a time or two again. So for example, suppose that we have w squared uh, plus, uh, say, mm, no, let's do minus, because let's just mix it up. Minus 10w uh, minus 3 is equal to 0. OK. So I want you to solve this. So uh, when, when the instruction is just solve, uh, you should, and, and the method uh, in which to solve is not specified, you should choose whatever is the easiest possible thing. So the first thing you should ask yourself, uh, can you factor this easily? No. You can't, right? Because you can't think. You can't find two integers whose product is 3 and whose sum is 10. Okay, there, aren't, there aren't integers that do that. Uh, in the second place, you might ask, um, are there zero Ws? So are there zero? No. How many are there? There's negative 10 of them. If there were zero, then the, then the equation would look like that. And you'd be able to move the 3 over to the other side and solve with radicals. So OK, we can't do that. So that means that if, we, if you can't factor it, then you can't solve it with radicals the easy way, then the only way forward is what? The thing we talked about last time. Complete the square. Complete the square. So remember, complete the square is comes down to this trick where you add zero, but you're sort of doing so cleverly. Okay. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to add some amount and then subtract this same amount. So how much are we going to add and then subtract? Not 20. 20 <coughs> 25. Now how do, we, how do we get to that answer? But this is negative 10. What, why will it be the same thing? OK, I agree. So you take, you take the b coefficient, which, which is negative 10. Half of that's 5. Uh, sorry, negative 5. Then we're going to square that and get 25. And then we're going to add this much and subtract that much. So add 25, subtract 25 like so. So we add and, and subtracted 25, which seems like a strange thing to do. But these first three terms now factor as a square. How do they factor? Negative five. Right. So this would be w minus 5, all squared. And then collect the constants. Uh, that'd be negative 28 equal to 0. Then we can get w minus 5 squared is 28, moving the 28 to the other side. So now the structure of this equation is the, ki is the kind of structure we can deal with. Right? This is something squared is 28. Something squared is 28. And if it, if it said y squared is 28, then what would we be able to say that y must be? Or negative squared of 28, one or the other. So. Either w minus 5 is negative square root 28, uh, 28. Bless you. Or w minus 5 is uh, square root 28. And then now we can, we can solve for w to obtain that w is 5 minus the square root of 28, or w is. 5 plus 
the square root of 28. I'm sorry, but we're having class. You need to leave. Not, not, not later, now. Thank you. It's incredibly rude to interrupt a class like that. <clears throat> okay, so now all of the examples that we've done so far of completing the square, they've all been for monic polynomials. So what, is, what does that mean, monic? The leading coefficient is 1. So we need to do one where the leading coefficient is not 1. So how about uh, 3y squared plus 12y minus mm, 8 is equal to 0. So is it monic? It's not monic. So in order to use the same skill that we had before, <coughs> we'll collect all of the y's together all of the terms that do have y and then exclude the terms that do not. So all the terms in the square parentheses have a y and all the terms outside of the parentheses do not have a y. So now we're going to factor out what's making this quadratic not monic. <coughs> so now that the quadratic inside of the square parentheses is monic, so now we can complete the square on it. So now part of the trick here to make sure that this works correctly is that we're still going to add 0. We're still going to add 0, but the place that it's occurring, it has to occur inside of these square parentheses. So how much do we need to add and then subtract? Four. Right, so it'll be half of that because because we we've grouped these in here and, and, and it's isolated in there. It's like we're only looking at that bit. So half of four is two, and then square that is four again. So that would be that would be add four and then subtract 4. And that has to occur inside of the parentheses. So the reason why I keep saying that has to occur inside of the parentheses is by the time we get this 4 out of the parentheses, what will it be? It'll be a 12. Why will it be a 12 by the time it gets out? Because it's going to be multiplied by this 3. OK. So. How do the first three terms, uh, these three terms, factor? Y plus 2 all squared. <coughs> minus 4 and then minus 8. So now we can distribute this. 3 times Y plus 2 squared and then minus 12 and then minus 8 is 0. <clears throat> so now we can collect the constants and put them on the other side. And in one more step, it'll be, one of, it'll be of the shape that we're used to. What do we need to do? divide by 3. So now now we've through all this work we've now transformed it into one of those that that we know how to deal with. Okay. So 
That means that y plus 2, there's two possibilities for y plus 2. What are, what are the possibilities? Thank you. Uh-huh. Very good. Okay, so we can solve for y. Very good. So any question about this one? So this one kind of makes the monic ones look easy, right? Because you don't have to deal with with this three all, all over the place. OK. So now, we need to see why is it, why is it called completing the square? Uh, you know, that seems like a strange kind of name to give it. So, so every quadratic equation, every quadratic equation can be written in this way, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0 with a not 0. So all of them all of them can be written in that way. Uh, but for to explain why it's called completing the square, I'm going to uh, take the slightly simpler case. I'm going to take the simpler case when a is 1, that is to say the monic case and also c is 0. So we're going to take this slightly simpler case so that it looks like x squared plus bx. That is to say 1x squared plus bx plus 0. Okay, now suppose that we want to complete the square for this. How much will we need to add and then subtract? B over 2 all squared. So we're going to add, we're going to add B over 2 squared, and then we're going to subtract B over 2 squared. So now these first three terms, these first three terms factor, they factor as x plus b over 2 squared, and then this one remains. So minus b over 2 squared. OK. So algebraically, this is what, different, this is what completing the square does, is it, is it comes to this position where you have the difference of squares. So I'm calling it the difference of squares because this thing is squared, that thing is squared, and we're subtracting. The difference of squares. OK, so that's the algebraic point of view. Now here's the geometric point of view. So we're going to start again with this expression, x squared plus bx. And uh, one of the things that I'd like for you to be able to take away from this class is the geometric interpretation of multiplication. So let's consider for a moment. Consider a rectangle that has one of its side lengths is 3 and the other side length is 5. What is the area of this rectangle? 3 times 5. So the area is the product of the side lengths. So this is the connection between geometry and arithmetic, and that is that product is associated to area. Products and areas are associated. So, so have a look at this expression. What is the greatest common factor in this expression? X. So I'll factor out the X. 
and then we would have x plus b. So what I want you to see is that this is a product, but now I'm going to reinterpret this as being a rectangle, the area of a rectangle. So here we go. I'll say that this, that this here is x, that's x, and that this side is x plus b, and that we're talking about the area of this rectangle. So now I'm going to take that rectangle, and I'm going to make a little creased line right there where x is so that this is x, that's x, and how much is this part? This is B. And have I changed the area by putting that dashed line there? No, right? You can, mar you can make a little mark on something. It doesn't change its area. OK. So now I'm going to take that rectangle. I'm going to leave that mark. This is x. This is still x. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bisect this piece right here. I'm going to cut it into two equal halves. So how much is that piece? This is b over 2. And the other one? Another b over 2. So this is b over 2, and this is b over 2. And now I'm going to, I'm going to give them colors so that you can watch how I move them. So this will be the red one and this the green one. So now, suppose that I cut with scissors on that line and that line uh, so that we have three separate pieces. What, what, will the area change as a result of making those cuts? No, right? It doesn't, doesn't change the area. So what I'm going to do is I'm, gonna, we're, I'm going to cut the green piece off and I'm going to move it. So, so far, I've drawn all the pieces but the green piece, but, and now I've got to show you where I put the green piece. So, I put, I put the green piece here. So, the green piece is there. Now, what is, what is this length right here? That's right there. That's B over 2 right there. Okay, so now, it's not a rectangle anymore, but ignoring what's happening in the corner for a moment, how tall is it? X plus B over 2. And how wide is it? X plus B over 2. So, if it weren't for this bite that we took out right there, then because this, is, this length is the same as that length, this would be a square, wouldn't it, if it weren't for that little bite? Maybe you would agree with me if I said that this square was incomplete? Would you, would you agree <coughs> on that score? So let's go ahead and fix it. So now we're going to fix it, and the way we're going to fix it is we're going to fill in this little corner. Now, what's the vertical measure of, of this, of what we're missing? And what's the horizontal measure of what we're missing? Also be over 2. So you're telling me that we're missing a little square. So I'll add that much square. So I added it in, but we had to take it from somewhere. 
So I'll say that this is subtract the same amount. And of course, that's b over 2 and b over 2. What's the area of this? b over 2 squared, right? It's b over 2 squared. So you're telling me that, that in the end we have the difference of squares? So can you see it? I even took the time to write these in blue and these in blue. Can you see it? Those are in blue, these are in blue. <laughs> Lovely, huh? <clears throat> so this is why it's called completing the square. It's not just some name that people just pulled out of the air. Yes? It, 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 it really depends on your point of view. Uh, be, because uh, here's, here's an important thing that you should understand about your colleagues, all the people in here. So everybody learns in a little bit of a different way. Okay? And for every topic, for every person, they kind of have a place where they kind of feel like they first know a thing. Okay? Well, um, it, it's, not, it's not correct to say that everyone can be put in these two groups, but by and large, as an instructor, I have observed that more or less everyone can be fit into one or two groups. They're either algebra people, when they know a math thing, they know it algebraically, or they're geometry people. When they know something, they know it geometrically. And my goal is always to, to identify which one you are and then pull you the other direction. Okay. So, so that's why I try and draw pictures and do algebra, because I'm trying to pull all of you contrary to your, uh, to your inclination. So that being said, when I'm, when I'm thinking about this, I'm not, I'm not thinking like this. I'm thinking like this. This is how I think, and then I'm translating it. It, it is like I'm translating it to this on the fly on your behalf. So that, so that I can, so that we can communicate. Yes? Really, really quick, could you explain uh, the type of mean square again? I understand that it's the uh, b over 2 minus b over 2, but. Mm -hmm. So do you agree that the, that missing thing has dimensions b over 2 by b over 2? Yeah. So if I, so I'm saying I add it in but I had to take it from somewhere. So if I added, say, 8 here, I have to subtract 8 there. That makes sense. It's the same thing here. Add 0, add 0. Other questions? <clears throat> OK. Good. So now, what if? What if we take? a quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0 with a non-zero a. And what if we never specify a, b, and c, and we just let them be, in a sense, variables? We let them be variables. Suppose that we do that, and then we begin to complete the square. So let's complete the square, or at least start to. What we'd have to do is we'd have to factor out the a so that the result, so that the quadratic would be monic. So then that would be a and then x squared plus b over a x and then we'll isolate the c all by itself because it doesn't have an x equal to zero. And then we'd have to add in here x squared plus b over a plus uh, b over a x that is. Uh, and then plus b over 2a, because that's half squared, and then minus b over 2a squared, and then plus c equal to 0. Imagine that we just kept doing that on down the line. We don't have enough time to go through the whole thing, but in principle it's possible. If we were to do it, then we would arrive at the following uh, situation. We would come to negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, and then all of these things divided by 2a. And what's the name of this? This is the quadratic formula.
and it is something that you were expected to memorize. Now this, this here, is a quadratic equation. So an equation like this, something that you've got to solve, that's a quadratic equation. This, something that you could plug into, that's a formula. So I won't count off if you mess, mess up the distinction, but I'm just letting you know that I hear a lot of students say that this is the quadratic equation. No, it's not. It's the quadratic formula. And it just sounds like it's, it's like scratching on the chalkboard <laughs> to me anyway. Okay. So the quadratic formula. Now for some of you this may be uh, one of the most complicated formulas you have to memorize, but it is one you have to memorize. Uh, I promise you you can memorize it. I promise you you can. Because I have two children and when, when each of them were between three and four they knew it. Okay, they knew it because, because when we were in the car driving or when I, was, when I was giving them a bath, we would sing <clears throat> negative b plus or minus the square root, the square root of b squared minus 4ac of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, all over 2a. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah. To pop goes the weasel. Yeah. But we'll we'll omit it. No, let's do that one. No. Look it up on YouTube. It's all over the place. And you may think it's kind of strange that your instructor is is singing. Okay. I, I found it very <laughs> to, the, to the tune of Frere Jaca. But in two weeks' time, in two weeks' time, you're gonna be tested over this in the testing center. And you may be sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, I've just blanked on the quadratic formula. And then you might hear one of your, one of your other classmates taking the class going, hmm, hmm, hmm. And then, oh, I got it. I got it. <laughs> and if that, if that happens, then I have succeeded. Okay? Good. So, that being the case. Okay, you'll be okay. 3x squared. Mm, plus 5x uh, minus mm, 10 is equal to 0. And I want you to solve with the quadratic formula. So now, if, if I present you with an equation and, and, and I just say solve, then by all means, by all means, use the easiest possible method, whatever you see to be the easiest possible method. But sometimes I'm going to specify the method, and then in such a case, you must use this method. So I've said, use the quadratic formula. Okay. In this case, we need to identify the coefficients a, b, and c. So what are they? A is 3, b is 5, <coughs> Not negative 10. Negative 10, right. Okay. <coughs> so any question about, about these coefficients? Okay. Now, the quadratic formula is just a matter of plugging, plugging stuff in and carrying out some arithmetic. So negative 5 and then plus or minus square root 5 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 10 over 2 times 3. So any question on how all those things got plugged in. Okay, so in the radical we have, uh, we have 25 and then this is going to be an addition because the negatives cancel and that would be 12 times 10 which is 120. So 120 plus 25. So negative 5 plus or minus square root 25 plus 120 and then over 6 So negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 145 
over 6, and then I want you to write your answers separately. There are two of them. What are the answers? Yes, negative 5 plus the square root of 145, that's one of them, 45. And then what's the other one? Very good. So the quadratic formula is nice in the sense that it reduces the whole thing down to some arithmetic. There's no, no algebraic manipulations are necessary, just formula, plug it in, simplify. Any question about the quadratic formula? Okay, good. <clears throat> so now, uh, we're in the next section which is section, I don't know, I think it's section 2.6 or something. And it's called something like other equations. So what I mean by that is that we now know how to solve linear equations. We can solve, we can solve things that look like this. Uh, Ax plus b equal to 0. So then when there's no x squareds, this is in a sense as easy as it could be. You just move the b to the other side, divide by a, you're done. So we know how to do those kind. Uh, we know how to do this kind, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0 with a non-zero a. Such things are called quadratic equations. We've got, we can, we can handle that. So what I mean by other equations, I mean things that aren't, aren't these. Okay. So in order to be successful, we've got to understand just, just what is permissible to do to an equation. Okay. So in the first place, consider that we have given that a is equal to b. Suppose this, is, suppose this is the case. Then in the first place, that uh, you can do this. Supposing that's true, you can do this. So what have I done here? Yeah, I added the same number to both sides. So that you can do this for all c, which is to say you can add the same number to both sides. That also, and because there's negative numbers, that also means you can subtract, right? Add 5 to both sides, always going to be fine. Now, uh, <coughs> you need to understand what this means. This means that suppose that we start with an equation that's true. So for example, here's an equation. So, so here's an equation, 8 equal to 8. Is it true? Yes. Yes. OK. What if, what if we add 3 to both sides? Is that <coughs> still true? Yes. It is. So adding 3 did not modify the truth. It was true in the beginning. It was true in the end. Okay, what about, what about uh, 13 equal 14? Okay, so is it an equation? Yes, and it is false. Okay, suppose that we add the same number to both sides. 13 plus 2 equal 14 plus 2. How about that? Still false. So what I want you to understand is that adding something to both sides is truth preserving. If the equation was true, then it is still true. If the equation was false, it is still false. Okay. 
2. A multiplied by C equal B multiplied by C for all C. And now, what's written on the page right now is false. It, it is not correct. So I'm going to leave myself a, a, a blank spot here where I'm going to, I'm going to add one more thing to make that statement correct. <coughs> so, so let's see. Suppose that we have 8 equal 8. Is it true? Yeah. It's true. Suppose we multiply both sides by 3. Is it true? It's true. Okay, so it was, it was multiplication by 3 preserved the truth. How about 13 equal 14? This is false. What if we multiply both sides by 3? Still false. So that's good. So multiplication by 3 preserves the truth. Now, can you multiply by just any number that you want? Will multiplication by a number always preserve the truth? No matter what number you select? Probably not, because why would I be going down this line of questions? Let's consider. 13 equal 14. False, yet again. But now I'm going to multiply both sides by a number, and the resulting equation is going to be true. 13 multiplied by 0. 14 multiplied by 0. What is the resulting equation after you do that? It's 0 equals 0, right? Is that true? It is. It also looks like an oxygen molecule. <laughs> if you've taken a chemistry class. So multiplication by zero is able to modify the truth. It's able to modify the truth. Th going in this direction, that's multiplication by zero. Going in this direction, that's division by zero. This is the reason why it is not permissible. This, well, this is yet another reason why it is not permissible to divide by zero. You can't multiply both sides of an equation because you could modify the truth. You can't divide by zero because you could modify the truth. OK. Three. Another thing that we're really going to need to do is we're going to need to square both sides of an equation. Oh, I left myself a box. What, what do I need to write in the box? For, for all C except C is 0. So now it's, now it's right. So now we're going to want to square both sides of an equation. This will not preserve the truth in all cases. So it's truth preserving only when Both sides have the same side. Uh, ha both sides have the same sign. Okay. By way of example, uh, how about four equal four? Is it true? It's true. Suppose we square both sides. 4 squared equal 4 squared. Is that true? It is. Now, can someone give us an equation for which squaring both sides does not preserve the truth? Not quite. I need the one before you do any squaring. Oh. 
Well, okay, I, I agree. But, but the thing is, the thing is squaring, that, that's false. That equation is false. But squaring both sides is still false. So it went false to false. So it didn't, it didn't cause a problem there. How about, how about this? How about negative 2 equal 2? Is that true? It's false. Let's square both sides. What is the left-hand side going to be? 4. And the right-hand side? Also 4. This is true. So do you observe that squaring both sides can modify the truth? <coughs> OK, good. So what this means, what this means is that it's always going to be permissible to add or subtract. And you'll ne that'll never go wrong. It is some of the time, mo most of the time even, going to be OK for you to multiply both sides by something. If you know this something is not zero, then, it, then it's OK. If, it, if in principle it could be zero, then you've got to watch out. And then finally, squaring both sides, whenever you do this, if, if either side could have opposite signs, then all, the, all subsequent steps are now under suspicion. OK. So let's have an example. OK. So solve the square root of 15 minus 2x is equal to x. OK. So unlike the previous equations that we solved, these kind, so in principle, for this equation right here, you could plug in any x that you want. I don't mean to say that, in, that the resulting equation would be true, but I mean that you could at least evaluate the equation as being true or false. Same thing with this. You could plug in any x that you want. Is that true for this one? No, no it is not true. Because in particular, this, this equation, I want you to solve it in the reals. So because I want you to solve it in the reals, it's not permissible to plug in any x at all. So could you plug in x is 0? I, and I'm not asking if the equation is true. I'm asking whether or not it's possible to do. Yeah. It is. Because if you did, it'd be square root of 15, which is a perfectly legitimate number, equals 0. The resulting equation is false, but you could still plug it in. Could you plug in negative? No. Could you plug in 10? You could not plug in 10. So why not? Do I have something against 10s or something? There'd be a negative in the radical because it'd be 15 minus 20. You can't have negatives in the, ra in the radical if you're dealing with the reals. Okay? So not all x's are permissible. As a result, for this kind of equation, the very first thing that we must do is compute the natural domain. OK, so the natural domain, what, can someone in plain language remind us what the natural domain is? Yeah, it's the largest set uh, of x's that can be plugged into this equation. So the right-hand side offers no restriction. The right-hand side, you can plug in any x, and it'll never blow up. But the left-hand side, the left-hand side does have some x's which just can't be allowed. Okay? The left-hand side requires that 15 minus 2x must be greater than or equal to 0. That's what it needs. So let's solve for x. 15 greater than or equal to 2x divide both sides by 2 so that we have 7 and a half greater than x. And then y'all are usually more comfortable if x is on the left. So how do you write, uh, how do you write this in interval notation? You would do where that's x is, I can't see the sign right in front of it. Is that greater than or? 
This is less or equal. <coughs> okay. What if I what if I put this right here? Okay. Then yes. <laughs> Uh-huh. And you would have negative infinity. Uh-huh. And then you would have a um, x. Well, no. Can you put x in here? Not, not when you're doing interval so notation. So you would put your 7.5. Uh-huh. So then you would be the bracket. Bracket. Very good. There it is, an interval notation. So that means that, you know, the, the point of, of writing this is so that you can look at this very easily and say, well, would it be permissible to plug in 20? No. It's not in here. Would it be permissible to plug in negative a million? Yes. Yeah. I'm not saying the equation would be true. I'm saying that in principle it could be done. Okay. How are we doing on time? I hear y'all stirring. Yeah, one minute. One minute. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll end up fully solving it next time, but what I want you to observe is the following. Uh, if we want to solve this equation, then the first, the first problem that we face is that we have variables inside of radicals. We have variables inside of radicals. And we can't have variables inside of radicals. We need them to be outside of radicals. How, how are we going to do it? We're going to square both sides. But now, warning bells should be going off. Why? Why should warning bells be going off for you? Well, I agree, but even before, even before this, so you, there should be warning, alarms, from the previous page. We're squaring both sides. Does that, does that preserve the truth? Yeah. It doesn't. So we don't know whether or not we, what we just did is legitimate. We know, we're not sure. So that means that all subsequent steps are now under suspicion. And yes, this is as far as we'll get today. But do you observe now that it's a quadratic equation? Oh, I'm so glad we have tools to solve quadratic equations. Okay, see you next time.